welcome to the World is One Beyond Global Leadership Series. With me today is Dr. Amina Gurib Fakim, former president of Mauritius, award winning scientist, academician, university vice chancellor, the first woman Muslim head of state in Africa. Dr. Gurib Fakim, welcome to Beyond. Thank you so much for having me. Your bio, as I said, was incredible. Uh, and I've been trying to figure out how best to introduce you, and I've thought of many ways, so this is what I've come up with. How about you doing it yourself and telling us what, according to you, is the most defining part of your personality? <laughs> well, you missed out something very important. I am a, I'm a proud mother of two. And uh, to me, uh, be, having been able to be a mother has been a very, very important part of my life. But having said this, I like to think of myself as somebody who likes to create things and somebody who likes to empower uh, young girls so this is something that I'm giving my time now after the presidency to empower more and to create more. It's an admirable pursuit. A few years back, you fought this presidential election with virtually no political experience and you won. What made you choose politics? Well, I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint many people. I never chose the world of politics. The world of politics chose me. For all that you have said so far, being a Muslim, a woman, and scientist, untainted politically. So I presented a fresh face to the world of politics, and this is why I suppose I've been chosen. And I think it did weigh in the last general election. Did you ever imagine that you'll become the president of your country? Never. And this is why the messaging I have for, for people and for young people is to keep on dreaming and to keep on saying, yes, it is possible and try and get there. Sure. You're, you mentioned your children. and I think uh, no matter what you achieve in life, uh, your family is what keeps you grounded. So you may be a hero for the world outside, but they'll tell you this is what you can do and this is what you cannot. So how did they react when you said that you're running for president? Well, initially, uh, you know, they were quite surprised because uh, I come from a family which has remained apolitical all along. But uh, when I discussed this at home and I said that uh, if given a chance, I could help serve my country at the highest level. So I took the bet. I took a risk. And I think I got support for having taken that risk. And today I'm very happy I took that risk. And again, this is a message I send to young people. Always learn to take a risk. Because, again, something which is not taught in business school and something that we have to live with and uh, use that as a tool to get further. Take risks, you say. But we often say that we need more professionals, doctors, scientists, engineers, to take up politics and to take up policy making because they come from specific fields and they understand what the demands are. Why do you think they don't do it? I think for many reasons, but as you have said, uh, it is very, very important to have uh, more scientists, more professionals in the political world, because we are living in a very uncertain time and completely uncharted territory. I think we see the challenges that the world is facing, uh, be it political, be it environmental. Uh, but I think the world of politics, as has been practiced so far, has not tempted many people uh, because of all the reasons that we know. Uh, but I think it's an institution which is very important and we need more young people, we need more professionals, and we need to change the narrative that politics is an important institution, we have to invest ourselves in it. But more importantly, it's an institution where you're called to serve, not to serve yourself, to serve first. I think this is the ambition, this is the messaging we have to get out there so people know that when they're going in the world of politics, it is first and foremost to serve. Serve and not serve yourself. Uh, very important words there in your four years and four odd years that you've, uh, you've, you've spent as the president of Mauritius. What has been your biggest contribution and your area of focus? When I came to the presidency, I said, first of all, that uh, I did not want to be a president who do prosaic things. I wanted to get things moving in terms of training capacity building for young people. And I brought in the narrative that uh, we need science, and science has been accepted by the UN in 2015 when they approved the Sustainable Development Goals. And the slogan that was used there is to leave no one behind. So what I think has been the defining moment of my presidency has been that we need to empower people with the tools of science so that we can deliver on the SDGs by 2030. And 2030 is not very far away. It's... Uh, 
It's there, 11 years. And uh, if we don't get our act together, and we have seen, for example, how uh, the preparedness, and this is something we have to congratulate uh, uh, the people in Odisha uh, for having showed preparedness uh, into, with the cyclone Fani. And this is something that the messaging that we can learn from because we're an island and we are constantly being threatened with cyclones and deadly ones. And I think what we saw in Odisha is something to write home about. And I think there we have to congratulate the people for the preparedness. And this is something that I brought home is we need to be be prepared. We need to show adaptation. And uh, this is something that I feel has been the defining moment of my presidency. Also, another thing that I also brought on board is the concept of entrepreneurship. Because geographically, politically, Mauritius, we belong to the African continent. And on the African continent, the World Bank figures are not encouraging in as much as we have 11 million graduates landing on the job market every year. Creation of jobs by government will be impossible. So we need to inculcate this entrepreneurial fiber in the youth. And this is something that I have been able to bring on board because I was in the past a scientist and entrepreneur as well. Right, and these are two issues that India too is dealing with. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned Cyclone uh, uh, Fani here in Odisha. And uh, being prepared for something like this is only one part of the battle. The other is to ensure that such things are not repeated, their intensity does not go up. So while Cyclone Fani was happening in Odisha, we had snowfall in another part of the country in Himachal, and we had record-breaking heat uh, in New Delhi. Climate change is here, and it's, it's a real threat. Do you think governments are doing enough the world over to deal with it? I think, first of all, there has to be an understanding of what climate change is. I mean, yesterday, the IPBES released a report where it is reporting one million species which are threatened with extinction. I don't think it has trickled down in the narrative of people's everyday life. So there is a huge uh, work that has to be done in terms of bringing it to the people, but in terms of explaining what it means. I mean, you keep on talking about climate change, but who is really appreciative of the challenges that this presents to the world? You have mentioned uh, Himachal Pradesh, you have mentioned uh, drought, you have mentioned Fani. We have the same thing world over, but I don't think people are awake enough. And I think this is where presidents, prime ministers and ministers have to flag this into the narrative, into the speeches, but more importantly, make it happen on the ground. And this will come with the appropriate investment, with the appropriate empowerment and the empowerment of women because Women in Africa, I know women feed the continent because women are the people who are involved in agriculture on a daily basis. So this is something that we need to do, but more importantly, invest in our people. It will not it will not happen with handouts. It will not happen until we put our hands in our own pocket and empower our own people. Indeed, and I think you're the best place to comment on this because you've been you are a scientist, you've worked in this field extensively, and you've also been a policymaker, so you, you know what the gaps are and how they can be filled. Some South Indian states produce more green energy than uh, many European countries with the best carbon record. Developing countries, we believe in bits and pieces, are doing their bit, but the developed world still remains insincere in fulfilling its side of the bargain. And this, is, this has been a long-standing debate. It's been on for decades. How do we work around it? Well, there are some developed countries uh, which are making headway. We see, for example, countries like the Nordic countries. One of them that comes to my mind right now is Denmark. And uh, they are already ahead of the curve. Uh, But, you know, in terms of challenges, I think we all have to be appreciative of the fact that those countries which are threatened with uh, these challenges will be developing countries. And uh, again, what we're witnessing in the world is increasing gaps, increasing gaps in inequality. And uh, we see what technology is doing. And uh, when we increase the gap in terms of inequality, which means there's been less resources devoted to these things. And precisely, if you look at Asia as a continent, we find that Asia will be hosting about 3.7 billion people. So the challenges are going to be in the developing world. So how do we empower, how do we ensure the shift? I'm not talking about handouts again, but how How do we ensure a global solidarity among our leaders to see to it that those which who are precisely lower down the rung of the ladder, they are empowered? Because what's going to happen is that those countries, the haves and the have nots, they will be uh, they will also meet the challenges because what, what we're witnessing already is increased migration. 
And this is becoming an issue in the developed world. So why do people migrate? Why do people want to leave the lands? Why do people want to leave their homes to, to make to take the risk to travel, you know, the oceans to get to a better place? So I think if we want to actually stop this and make sure that people stay in their countries, we need to help them. And this is where we call for a global solidarity. You have mentioned the climate change as being an issue which is challenging the world. But again, how are we going to do it alone? How is, for example, a country like Mauritius uh, going to combat increased acidity of the ocean? It can't be done alone. It has to be done regionally. It has to be done with uh, the global uh, population. And we have to ensure that we all look after the global commons. And this is not something we can do alone. This is only this will only be done through partnership and through collaboration. And this would include, I assume, collaboration of the big players like America. So what do you say to people like the US President Donald Trump, who still calls climate change a hoax? We are in this boat together. There is no planet B. There is only one this planet. And interestingly, you've mentioned America. But again, America, we have a federal system and many of the states, they are on board. If you look at the, the policy, for example, in San Francisco, I mean, they are fully on board in terms of addressing climate change head on. So I think we all have to do our bit and uh, we don't need to actually, uh, you know, share the kind of put the blame on others. Everybody has to be empowered. Everybody has to play their part. And here I also talk about the citizen, because very often we tend to put a lot of uh, importance, we put a lot of emphasis on policymakers, but politicians come and go. And we as citizens, we have to ensure that we do our bit, we teach our kids to do our bit, and it's only then that the world would be a better place. Indeed, since you're a scientist and a politician, I must ask you about the science versus faith debate. We often deal with it here in India. Does the twain ever meet? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. You know, science, we base ourselves on facts, on evidence. Uh, faith, you believe. Uh, there are points where they can meet. Uh, but I think what we have to admit is that there are instances when have to agree to disagree. Right. Uh, you've spoken like a politician, I believe, more than a scientist. How do you trace, uh, trace back your ancestors to India? Um, uh, my ancestors left Ghazipur in Uttar Pradesh in 1862, and uh, I am the fourth generation people of Indian origin. And uh, recently I got my PIO card, uh, which uh, I'm very proud of. Sure. Do you follow what's happening here in India, especially in Uttar Pradesh, the elections, the temple politics, whatever's going on? Well, India is now a very weak player in the world economy. So what happens in India resonates with the whole world. So the whole world is watching and uh, we wish you all the very best in the general elections. And we hope that uh, the people, that Indian people, that the, that the politicians, the Indian people who vote will work to the best interest of every single Indian. And a, and a word on the, the leadership of uh, the current Indian Prime Minister who's also spoken a lot on climate change and global forums and said that India will do uh, its, its uh, part of the deal. Uh, I think uh, Prime Minister Modi launched the Global Alliance in 2015. In fact, I attended that ceremony in Paris. And uh, India, uh, I think uh, they are already uh, doing their bit in terms of making renewable energy accessible. So we just hope that uh, with the, the, the power, uh, you know, India is a powerhouse in science and technology. And I think they will be able to bring in um, the necessary tools so that people can get access to energy. Because energy is the lifeblood of any economy. And the more people are empowered, uh, the better it's going to be for everyone. Because India, again, is going to be one of the biggest uh, uh, source of human capital, young people, and uh, they need to be educated, they need to have access to water, all these basics. And I think that uh, getting the right technology, making technology available, uh, all this will go towards the, the, you know, the well-being of the people of India. Um, and... The other link that I can think of is Bollywood. The first major Indian production filmed in Mauritius, if I'm not wrong, was Chandi Sona in 1977. How big is Indian cinema in Mauritius? And do you follow any of those films? 
Of course we do. We all do. And I think Bollywood is bigger than uh, India, if I may <laughs> say so. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, well known across the world. And uh, people have learned Hindi through Bollywood movies. So many Bollywood movies have been made here. And the last one I remember watching uh, the shooting was uh, Kuch Kuch Hota Hai. I saw the shooting. Very well. <laughs> the shooting, yes. Uh, because it was done in the campus of the University of Mauritius, and I was there working at the time. So you could see all the big Indian stars performing there. India, the Bollywood is a very big institution. I think through this, it's a very powerful tool to get Indian culture to the world. And I think it is doing just that. And I think it's, uh, it's it should be leveraged in messaging. It should be leveraged in showing the diversity of the Indian people, the Indian culture. And I think this is, of course, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the basis of what India represents through its culture, through its diversity, through its people. And of course, in terms of new numbers, I mean, there's no match. So I think you have everything going uh, to be a role model for the world. And who's your favorite star? Who's the, who's the biggest star in Mauritius, Indian star? Well, there are quite a few, uh, but I must say, if, if, you, if you can help me get the message across that I'm a great fan of Shah Rukh Khan. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do our best, yes. <laughs> you, you must have met him during the shooting there. No, I was just watching from afar because, you know, when actors are shooting, you have to just stand from, from, from afar and watch. Uh, but he's been a great actor and I think he's been a great ambassador for India. Uh, I saw him in Davos a couple of years ago. And I think he's he's getting the message out of what India represents. Uh, India as a powerhouse for technology, India as a powerhouse for diversity. And of course, uh, India, in terms of the future, I think the world uh, has a lot to learn from, from India. And I think another great uh, uh, person I have a great admiration for, and I read his books very much, of course, is Shashi Tharoor. He's a fun Indian intellectual. And also, he's sending out the message of what India represents in the world in the future. I can tell you, Shah Rukh Khan watches, Shashi, uh, watches, watches Beyond, and so does Shashi Tharoor. So hopefully, your message will go across. Uh, I also want to go, go back to your journey. As a woman, you made science your calling. As a Muslim woman, you say that you also dealt with religious discrimination. You filed a formal complaint. What has your yes. learning been from these personal struggles, which beyond a point are also the struggles of every woman? Uh, I will tell you, um, you know, a little story. When I was uh, a child, when I was uh, not a child, but a, a youngster, uh, I, I was taught, I was uh, infected by the virus of science by my teachers. And uh, I remember going to see the career guidance officer and uh, I asked him, you know, what are the prospects of a woman, of a lady, of a young girl uh, wanting to do chemistry at the time? You know what he said to me? He said to me, you know, you should never do that because science and chemistry is for boys. And a girl like you, when you come back home, there'll be no jobs for you. So I went home and I said to my father, well, this is the, what the career guidance officer told me. And he said to me, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to do science. And I did that and I followed my heart and I didn't follow my head. I followed my heart and this is something that I always done. And uh, I will tell you one thing as well. You've mentioned uh, the Equal Opportunity Commission. You've mentioned, you know, all these issues that we have to grapple with, being a woman, being a Muslim and all the rest of it. I am a product of precisely those challenges. I have learned to get to look at the, the, the better side of it. I've always looked at the lining and not the cloud, the silver lining all the time. When I was, uh, when, I, when I decided to file that, uh, uh, that, uh, that petition or that complaint rather to the commission, I had already set up my company. And this is why I had precisely left the university and I set up my own company. And because I set up my own company, because I, I left the university that I have been able to go in the world of politics. So my, my messaging to myself has been always turn around challenges and make them work for you. So th that's what you have to do. You know, life will never be a bed of roses. Uh, you just have to take the rough with the smooth, but never give up. Never, ever give up. That's my messaging. Very inspiring words. Uh, so what were your thoughts when the Me Too campaign gained ground the world over and women of all descriptions came out and said, this has happened with Me Too, and then there were those who said that this is all a, 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 a PR exercise that, that some people have hijacked the agenda. There was a lot of debate. So, so as someone who's lived those struggles, uh, what were your thoughts? 
Well, I'll just tell you a little story. I went for an interview, I remember, after getting my PhD. And at the time, of course, there was no, no such thing as sensitivity for having gender balancing on the panel. So I was there in front of me. There was a whole panel of middle-aged men. And uh, one of the questions I was asked is, uh, what will happen to you one day uh, when you decide to have a family? So I turned around and said to one of the gentlemen there, I said, sir, will you be asking this question to a man who representing in front of you? Because I knew by that time that I would not be getting the job. So Me Too movement or whatever movement, women's voice has to be heard, has to be heard loud, has to be heard clear that women now, women business, because we are 52% of this world population. We have power and this power has to be brought to the table. But having said this, one messaging again, women tend to disparage women more. And here I will cite to you Madeleine Albright when she said, there is a special place in hell for those women who don't help women. So any movement that we do, we need to ensure that we are helping that woman take her by the hand if she can't do it. So Me Too movement, yes, by all means, but make sure that we don't fall into extremes as well, uh, because sometimes they can use this tool for, for other reasons. So we stay focused. We make sure that the, that the women get respected and the women deserves that at society level, because women are the bedrock of the foundation of the family. So we need to get women respected there and we need to use the intuition and we need to use the talent of women to get things done. So Dr. Gurib Fakim, I want to end with what I began with. Entrepreneur, academician, scientist, president, and most importantly, as you said, mother, what next for you? Well, time will tell. I'm very happily living my fourth life. So who knows what the fifth life will, keep, will have in front of me. So again, I will have to keep on taking risk. So that's, that's going to be the beauty of it. That so we'll talk very soon and be hearing about me. <laughs> Absolutely. It sounds like a very good plan. All the very best to you. And thank you very much for joining us here on the Global Leadership Series, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, Suman. All the best. Thank you.